Hi there, welcome to the Raising Cinephiles podcast, a show about passing on your love of cinema to the next generation. I'm your host, Jessica Cantor, and I have worked in all facets of the entertainment industry for the last 20 years, and recently became a mom. Always remember that myself and guests are speaking from personal experience, not giving parenting advice. Let's go ahead and dive into the episode. This week, I am very excited to welcome Roma Bra. She is a writer and showrunner and entrepreneur in the film industry, has a really incredible background to shows Virgin River and Sullivan's Crossing, which I have trouble not binging. I really try. It's one of those, like, I turn it on thinking I'm going to watch one episode before I fall asleep. And seven episodes later, I realize that my son is waking up in the morning. Um, so both, I, I thank you for being here and I can't wait to talk to you more about, about this. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'll jump into our first question, which is what is your first movie memory? I remember my mom taking me to go see Dumbo, like when it first came out <laughs> at Disney, um, and, uh, leaving, I would think I was four or five, and I cried so hard when Dumbo's mother was uh, when Dumbo was taken away from his mother that we had to leave the theater. And so it was only when I was in my late twenties and I saw Dumbo again and watched the whole thing that I realized that they actually got reunited. Yeah, that, that's definitely like an age two where you just need your mama. So it's hard developmentally to see to see that. Yeah, it was was pretty traumatic. I have an identical twin sister, and I think we were both uh, disrupting the audience because we were both in blubbering tears. And then the the next memory I have was um, my parents taking me in their old, remember, like station wagon to the drive-in theater, and we watched the original Planet of the Apes. Oh. Um, And that one kind of left a a big impression on me. I ended up... uh, later becoming an anthropologist, primatologist, and working with chimps wow. before I got into the film industry. <laughs> yeah. So that, that really stuck with you, that movie. And how old were you, do you think, when you watched Planet of the Apes? I was young, too. I, 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 you know, I, I think probably was around the same, like five, six, somewhere around there. Yeah, it was, okay. it was when you were young. And so that stayed with you through, like, like secondary school, grad school, like the whole yeah, thing. I just, I guess, you know, watching, but well, those were gorillas, obviously not chimpanzees, but, you know, watching, um, watching that, I think really left a lasting impression. And then I, re- I read a Jane Goodall book later and that was one of the other things that helped, but, um, but that, yeah, it certainly left a lasting impression. And then I remember after that, we went to see Star Wars, the original, the first one, also mm-hmm. in the station wagon at the at the drive-in theater. And I, I remember that that was, uh, I just fell in love uh, with, with cinema. Um, it mm-hmm. was just such, you know, being in a different world uh, with different kind of creatures and characters and, I, and Princess Leah that we all aspired to be when we were younger. <laughs> I think I was 12. And yeah, I, I I could be completely wrong, but it was somewhere around there because I remember I went to camp and I missed the bus to go see it, and so my parents took me uh, oh, the next, that night or yeah. next night. Yeah. I so I'm wondering if the drive-in is an easier way to see movies when you're young because it's not so overwhelming, especially like under ten. You know, and like I find that when I bring and talk to parents about bringing kids, kind of in the five to 10 year old range to the movie theater, the sound is incredibly overwhelming for them. Yeah. I think, I mean, you know, I think my parents did that because if you, if you were going to fall asleep, you could just fall asleep in the back of the station wagon. And because these were, you know, Star Wars uh, and Planet of the Apes was certainly not something, you know, that normally a five-year-old or whatever, six-year-old would go see. (laughs) And they didn't probably didn't want me to be disruptive in the theater um, it's kind of like you're in a cocoon mm-hmm. of your, and you're safe because you're in with your family. There's nobody else there. There's no strangers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it was a, a nice way to see it. They don't, you know, they don't really have that many drive-ins anymore. Yeah. There was a, a little resurgence here in LA during, during the lockdown. Yeah. So I was able to kind of get myself in there again and get that experience that I, I never, I didn't really have that growing up. Um, but I do, you know, speaking of well, gorillas, is that I remember seeing gorillas in the mist. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, Diane Fossey. Yeah, that um, I was probably too young to see it because it was. I remember being incredibly scared, I'm traumatized because uh, she, you know she. Does, I don't remember in that. Yeah, she's killed in the movie, is she not? Yeah, it's it's. I don't remember. I don't. I, something was scary. I just remember being scared. I mean, Sigourney Weaver. That's when I like you know when I saw Ghostbusters around the same time. I was like, oh, that's the woman, you know, and it like I like linked. I linked like very different characters together somehow in my mind. It made Ghostbusters scarier for me, I think. Did you ever see Project X with, um, oh, I'm blanking on the actor's name. That was the one about um, the chimps that were being put into space. And then he breaks the, um, he breaks the chimps out because he's working there. Right. And he break, breaks them out of the place. It's like kind of sort of loosely based on a true story, but then of course, like it becomes fictional towards the latter half. Um, it sounds familiar, but I don't know. So I was a, assume- great, that was a great movie. I mean, Matthew Broad, Broderick uh, was the star in that one. Okay. One earlier films. And uh, I remember really loving that too. Yeah. Chimps and, and, they Jim's really made space. it. Yeah, Jim's in space. No, but it was more of an emotional, compelling story about yeah. somebody, you know, and Born Free. There's another one that I watched, but that's, I, I don't remember if that was a, a theatrical or a television. I saw it on TV, but it may have gone theatrical first. And, you know, just these compassionate, compelling stories about people standing up for animals. They were lovely. Yeah. And so what was it like as a, as a family seeing movies? You know, you said you had a twin sister. Did you have other siblings too? I had an older brother. He was uh, five years older than us. Okay. I mean, sorry, it makes it sound like he's passed away. He's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he is five years older. When I speak to people with older siblings, uh, especially like, you know, a, enough of a distance that the younger siblings get to see things a little more developmentally advanced. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think that, but you know, um, children actually watch up. Right. So mm. uh, they don't they don't they tend to watch uh, and want to emulate older children. Mm-hmm. Um, and same thing with, the, you know, so if you're five, you're watching people who are like seven and eight. And if you're 10, you're probably watching 15 year olds and 15, you're watching 18, 20 year olds, you know. Mm. So I think that uh, and mo- a lot of those shows kind of appeal, like especially the animal ones appeal to like family audience, which is nice. So there's not a lot of you know, too much tension or violence to uh, traumatize the kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. My um, my son recently has been obsessed with monsters. Mm-hmm. Just like, really, like, we have a sign, no monsters allowed on his door. Like, I mean, he's two. So he's very articulate for a two-year-old. And he's been asking to watch Monsters, Inc. Oh, yeah, but that's not scary. I mean, it has scary moments, right? So he'll like run to my lap. He know he's seen it like seven times now. He'll run to my lap, be scared in the moment, and then crack up. Yeah. <laughs> Ironically, isn't the one of the creatures called Sully? Yeah, which is you know the lead in my. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, I don't like uh, anything. That's yeah, a good. But- yeah. So I'm curious how, like, there's a big leap from be- being in. Well, there is and there isn't from being an. Apologist yeah. to being a writer, showrunner, director, producer of cinema and television. When did you know you had to scratch that itch? I'm from London, Ontario. Um, and then I went to uh, University of Calgary for my master's degree. And filmmaking isn't as big in Canada as it is. I mean, now it's getting, it's, of course, now it's a lot bigger than it was when I was growing up. Um, so it wasn't something I was really exposed to as a, you know, when you do those bubble tests at school to see where you're going to fit, uh, mine was PI and <laughs> a private investigator, uh, or lawyer, but there was zero, you know, bubble for entertainment and, uh, and producing. So when I, when I did my master's degree, I was collecting my data on the newly invented handy cam that was, you know, dinosaur size. So it was huge. Uh, definitely not like shooting a show on your phone. And um, I, I produced a documentary uh, from the footage that I had um, collected. Uh, that was a documentary called The Uncommon Chimpanzee about the bonobo. It was uh, not a professionally shot. It was all done with my my 
camera that I had for the research. I still had the time code on the bottom, but I edited it together um, and you know released it as a documentary because there weren't any other documentaries about the bonobo, so it ended up selling in um, all the colleges as a resource. Uh, and then Lonesome Dove, Lonesome Dove, the mini series, sorry, the television series, not the mini series, uh, came to town. That was one of the Scott Barstow and uh, Eric McCormick, mm-hmm. who had later on went on to play Will and Will and Grace. And mm-hmm. I, I applied for a job. Uh, there wasn't a very huge pool of people that were looking to get into the industry, so I was able to secure a job. And then at that point, I, I got, the, I got the bug because I realized you could really. It was a medium where you could touch a lot of people all over the world. And that was what I really wanted to do. What role did you play in your first job? Because I know I, I've played a lot of different roles. I was assistant <laughs> to the produce executive, uh, assistant to the executive producers and producers. And that didn't last too long just because I knew nothing. Like I came out of working with chimps. So what would I know about call sheets and production reports and um, the day out of days, et cetera. So uh, I, I didn't last too long, but then I, I went back. I didn't give up and I started working as a locations PA also on the same show and then a bunch of other shows. And then I worked my way up to a uh, second assistant director uh, and went, you know, eventually started producing. You know, there's a huge gap, obviously, between wanting to be a producer and actually becoming one. So, um, and then same thing with writing. Yeah. And your genre, you've, you've chosen romance as a genre. Can you speak to that and maybe if there was any inspiration in terms of television series and movies you watched growing up that might have stuck with you while you were moving in that direction? Well, I love all genres. I, I used to be quite addicted to horror movies, so that's obviously got nothing to do with romance. Uh, Freddy Krueger, you know, all of those mm-hmm. which terrified me, but I still watched them through my fingers um, as a kid. But I just like sh- I, I I like as I mentioned, doing shows that touch people mm-hmm. and that move them emotionally. And romance drama has a very dedicated audience. So when I was looking to develop my first series, because I had done a lot of television movies prior with Lifetime, I I still was leaning in my Lifetime movies towards shows that connected with people. The, one of the the first one I did was a, a movie called Taken Back Finding Haley. It was a movie about a mom who's a photographer played by, uh, she's like an art photographer played by Moira Kelly, also from... One Tree Hill, which is funny because it came back full circle with Chad mm-hmm. and Sullivan. And she uh, takes her eyes off her kid for a few minutes when she's taking pictures when her daughter's on the carousel and her daughter goes missing. And so she becomes a school photographer who goes, you know, from school to school over the course of 12 years looking for her daughter because she won't give up. And so that was kind of a different tone for a lifetime because lifetime is usually much more like female and jeopardy and or at least it was at the time and um a little bit more sensational and i wanted to do one that had a, a lot more heart and at the time i had just had a, a daughter who was three years old who actually plays little Haley in the show mm-hmm. and i it was kind of a passion project for me because I, I used to watch the commercials about people who lost their kids and I couldn't understand how you could lose your kid. But then when I had one, I suddenly realized that you can't be with them 24-7. You have to have some trust when they go to school or when they're with a babysitter. And I, I couldn't even fathom what it would be like to to lose a child and not have any closure. Um, so that was you know, where that developed from and uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question but you know the the romance eventually stemmed from looking for the right project that would connect with an audience and because it had the book series which is Virgin River that I had optioned had such a dedicated fan following and I did a lot of you know you'd asked me earlier how my anthropology degree kind of led me or how it helped but I kind of think like a scientist. So when I'm looking, I'm really kind of evaluating a lot of different uh, elements as to what's, you know, uh, the idea is to create a hit show. So I was trying to figure out how we would do that and what kind of property would 
we could adapt that would help us attain that goal. And Virgin River had such a dedicated audience with Robin Carr and the romance world in general has such a dedicated fan following. It's very much similar to the Marvel audience where they're so dedicated and go to, um, you know, Comic-Con, et cetera. And the romance people go there as well because Scott Patterson, Chad Michael Murray, even though they're not in Star Wars or in, um, you know, X-Men, they're at those autograph signing events and they get huge lineups of people. So, you know, that was why I ended up going into romance uh, drama. And I I consider it's really a drama with romance, the shows. Mm -hmm. And Sullivan's Crossing, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but, you know, it also has a lot of gravitas you know, it's not it's not a fluff, fluffy mm-hmm. uh, subject matter. It's it's something you can still watch with your whole family, um, but it has a lot of emotion. So it's kind of like a a lot more of a realistic drama that also has romance in it, mm-hmm. which I it like grounds it more um, to a larger audience. I think when it's not just a fluff fluff romance, so like the same beats of every Hallmark movie that. Mm-hmm or out there, which is, it's been an interesting, I've been writing some for that genre myself. And like, you kind of know what sells after a while of like, okay, I have a unique perspective. How do I put it in there? So it's different, <laughs> but these yeah. are the beats I have to hit, you know? Well, you know, it's very much of, you have a uh, parameters you have to fill and um, there's a formula uh, to mm-hmm. it and it works very well for the channel. Uh, people like it. And it's, you know, does extremely well for them. So, um, but we, we were looking to do something a little different from that. Yeah. And, and that's why you went more for the streamers as your. Well, it gave us a lot. Yeah. With Netflix, it, we, we wanted to do more, to have more leeway, not to have confines of having to think inside the box rather than outside the box. And so um, there's still one piece of the question, which is drama and romance what what have been your favorite in that genre as you were growing up and moving into this this world well you know not to sound uh like i'm not picking you know the classics but one of my absolute favorite movies of all time and i watch it at least once a year is a show called the family man with nicholas cage and tia leone and i think mm-hmm. it is one of the uh best written scripts I have ever seen. It's, uh, I know almost every word (laughs) from having watched it for, I don't know, 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, It's aspirational. There's romance. There's um, wish fulfillment in it. You know, it's just such a lovely, just a a wonderfully directed and well-written screenplay with incredible casting. You know, it's, it's something that I really enjoy and it makes me feel good when I watch it which is why I watch it at least once a year and sometimes if I'm de- depressed I'll throw it on because it just and the, the music that they use the score everything is perfect yeah I haven't watched that in a long time but not since I became a parent so I mean it's worth watching it again I'm curious where your kids fit into your journey as somebody that's a newish mom. I ask this a lot of of women of the push and pull and the mom guilt and how you deal with that while being ambitious and pursuing your career. It's a that was a big statement. So my my first <laughs> initial question is when they were young and they were coming in, where were you in this in this journey and how did you navigate it? So I had I had my kids later in life, so when I had Ben, who's my oldest, he's 17 now, um, I, I hadn't made it as a producer quite yet. You know, I was still trying. And I think having a, well, this isn't really answering your question, but I'll get to your question in a second. But having children or having Ben at the time really motivated me to try even harder and, and not give up. Um, on my dream because I just was so driven to provide for him. Um, I have a wonderful husband who's also in the industry and he, he was in foreign sales at the time and he was extremely supportive of me. So I would, he would go off to work in Beverly Hills and I would stay home and I would nurse Ben and I would type with my toes (laughs) as I was nursing. Um, and I, I was, I'm a very driven human being who doesn't, give up on her, you know, what what my goals are. So I just kept going. And I think that it also made me 
recognized um, that I wanted to do programming that, you know, a, a, for a wider age range, you know, than just adults as well. I didn't get quite into that until later because that was still the beginning of my career and you, you, you get to make what you get to make, you know, <laughs> when, you, when you pitch something. But um, so that and then you talked about mom guilt, which mm -hmm. I do do, you know, anybody that's a career woman, I, if there's somebody out there that's a woman that's, you know, doing well and in a career position that is, does not have guilt that has children, I, I couldn't even imagine it because it keeps me up at night. Um, <laughs> I, I'm completely, I mean, even now I was gone for season two, we were filming and I was out in Nova Scotia for um, six months. I didn't see my children. And when you have teenagers, they don't really uh, communicate well <laughs> with you on the telephone. And I'm really not a, a tweeting kind of a person, so uh, nor do I want that to be the way I communicate with my children. So it's tough, you know, it's very tough. Mm -hmm. And I'm lucky that I have a husband who helps me and, and we work together and we can we can juggle the, the kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I, well, similarly, I wrote the first movie that I got produced while my son was three months old. So bre while breastfeeding and delirium and something just comes out of you, you know, you're just like, it is going to be what it is. Maybe not my best work, but, um, which one was that? Uh, it's called the date whisperer. Uh, real one made it. I don't know where they sold it, but I think to a hallmark or a lifetime, it was originally a reimagination of Cyrano de Bergerac with some new technology. And then they stripped out all the technology and it ended up just being like Cyrano de Bergerac, the female. Was that, was that shot here or in, I mean, here being LA or in I'm Canada? not sure. I kind of wrote it and was done. I wasn't Are you American person. or Canadian? I'm American. Oh, okay. Cool. But my management at the time is Canadian. So I've gotten intro to a lot of Canadian companies. Oh, that's great. As a person working in the industry while your children are born, you said your daughter was in one of your shows. Mm -hmm. How do you remember introducing them to watching media, consuming it? Uh, well, if we're talking about any kind of media, obviously Teletubbies and, uh, you know, Sesame Street, um, Baby Einsteins, because we all, you know, decided that that was going to make them geniuses um, <laughs> because of the title. Um, so that was kind of the first, uh, their first intro. And I remember my son used to just go over and go, TT. <laughs> he wanted to watch TT. Um, so that was, the, that was first. And then we started watching, I think my daughter's first movie was, one of her first movies was E.T., and I think I had to watch that like 17 times in a row because she was completely in love with E.T. And I think she could identify also with the uh, with young Drew Barrymore character. And so that was that. And then we started watching things like, what was the one with Eva? <laughs> I remember the, I don't remember the okay. title. Um, and the, some, the Pixar shows, like you were mm -hmm. mentioning. Uh, later on, and uh, I think the first uh, Despicable Me came out, and that was something that I think my, my actually my f father had just passed away, and we were trying to keep my son occupied, so my brother took him to go see that. It was one of his first um, theatrical uh, movies, and he was smitten with uh, going to the the movies after that, and then we started sharing movies like Dead Poets Society, It's a Wonderful Life the original um star wars obviously the uh raiders of the last ark and then when they were old enough you know schindler's list and some other epic sophie's choice and things like that once they got older yeah and did you when did you get a sense of their taste well th they have very eclectic tastes i think like me it's they they're, they're not there's not one genre that they love um Although, you know, we still have, we do movie nights. And so it used to be a lot easier when there was less selection. <laughs> now movie nights consist of, well, first of all, we can't find anything uh, because it's, there's just no way to figure out what's playing on what platform. So that makes mm -hmm. it very difficult. And second of all, we don't, you know, everybody's got their differences of what they want to watch. So where my daughter wants to watch a rom-com and my son wants to watch a, a thriller. I want to watch something that's more futuristic because I like mm -hmm. 
to have I like sci-fi a lot um you know and then we spend you know about two hours arguing about what we're gonna watch yeah I am I spoke to somebody who had teenage kids and I don't remember who who it was but they said that they kept a family like google doc or notes page and whenever a movie came out that they wanted to watch they added them to the list and and basically when they had family movie night they just went to whatever is at the top of the list and it was sort of like a deal with the family so it would cut out the argument time yeah that that would mean that i'd have to have one child that's not really stubborn (laughs) (laughs) so we end up usually like like you said like okay eventually we'll watch yours and then tomorrow we'll watch somebody else's but it's been when i do have time that's what we do as a family um we we spend a lot of time making popcorn and watching various uh, either tv shows and my son really liked wu-tan um, and we watched that together and, uh, I can't remember what I watched with my daughter that she makes me watch. Oh, well, the Kardashians and things like that, that I were more reality type television, which I, I'm not really drawn to myself so much, but that she, she loves. Um, and it's a really nice way to bond with your kids, you know, uh, if, if you're yeah. watching the right programming and also kind of understand their taste as people. Yeah. I've spoken to a few people with, with teenage kids that are, you know, teenagers or kind of life in a in, everything is bigger for them than it would be for us as adults. And they utilized television and movies to have some of the bigger conversations outside of themselves. And I'm, I'm curious if, if you've done that with your kids. Yes. I mean, I think that's why we watch Sophie's Choice and Schindler's List and, and movies like that. Um, mm-hmm. to, they, we're, we're Jewish. So I wanted them to have a perspective of their history because you don't really it's not something that's really taught in schools. Um, so, and I think things like romantic love and things, you know, the, that you can lead into conversations uh, when, depending on where you get to in a show and what's happening on screen. We have very open communication at, in my house, so it's not something that I need a segue into to, mm-hmm. to talk about with them. But it also, you know, we used to watch a lot of high school drama uh, type shows that when my kids were going from public school into high school, of course, you know, diary of wimpy kids and, and shows like that, which I think give a nice perspective of what it's like to be bullied (laughs) um, in a pleasant kind of lighthearted way. So it, it allowed us to talk to them about, you know, those issues, I think in a, in a safe place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. I picked up on in this conversation as I'm raising a young Jewish boy, luckily in Los Angeles, you know, not in some other places in the world or country, uh, that it's yeah. not taught. Oh, no, no, no. It's great that there are movies like Schindler's List and Sophie's Choice and um, about different ex- cultural experiences. I'm myself also Jewish. And in today's climate, especially as a high schooler, with curriculum shifting and not teaching about all history. The use of cinema, I think, is is super important. And curious in this climate right now, if there's anything specific you're watching with your kids. No, because I'm too busy working, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, and you know, kids are really these days um, consuming. Their, especially at my kids' age, they're consuming their programming in a different way. Um, a lot of TikTok and videos, you know, online videos. We still we still do watch movies together, um, but not we're not doing it quite as often. And we've just renovated our, our living room, so uh, they they are monopolizing it with their friends. So we don't actually get to watch <laughs> with them. Um, I think at this age, they wait, they want less. They want more independence and less to do with their parents, which I think is biologically makes sense because they're getting ready to kind of leave the nest, but. Um, we we do talk about what's going on and it's more news related, I think, because they are consuming that through the social media platforms. They're not sitting down to watch the news per se, but it's not not accessible to them. And it's there's a lot of things on um, social media, I think, to that point. And so we do talk about what's going on, but not not in conjunction with cinema awesome. more news related. Yeah, the. um the movie that I saw this season that I thought was really powerful, I'm still not sure if I thought it it was good or like like I think it spurs a lot of conversation. Is Zone of Interest by 
Oh, I haven't seen it yet. Um, Glazer is the guy's last name. And it's about the family who runs a concentration camp and their life next door to, and just how, you know, you have the background of what's happening, but it's about them making a family. I mean, yeah. I watched is it the boy in the striped pajamas that was based on the book. So we, we watched that with our kids yeah, as well. But I, I don't know the one that you mentioned. I'll have to. It was this, it was like, I can this year. So it's pretty yeah. new. I, I got it in the awards screeners. Um, and it's, it's, it's not violent, but it's very mature. I think teenagers probably have the maturity to watch it, but it would definitely warrant a big conversation afterwards. Because mm-hmm. um, it's uncomfortable. I think the boy in the striped pajamas was similar, right? Because it was about the family of the guy that ran the concentration camp. So I don't know if it's got a similar thing or not. And yeah. Be horrible ending. <laughs> yeah, this this I mean it it's not it's just sort of a, a slice of a moment is how I mm-hmm. I watched it. But yeah, it was um it was interesting of like how you know and, and I don't know, it stuck with me. It was definitely an, talking about cinema that makes you feel things, mm-hmm. not necessarily always good things, <laughs> but being uncomfortable though is, is that something that's important because if it's making you uncomfortable then it's making you be introspective something else i looking at your career and the fact that you have your own company and you're where i i call you an entrepreneur that you're a showrunner you option material that you want to make you make a huge amount of work in the time that you're working you know i like to look at comparisons of of models in the entertainment industry and in some ways you're like the, a romance version of Tyler Perry, like building your <laughs> own studio and massive amounts of work and finding a really dedicated audience. And I'm curious if there's someone that you looked up to that you modeled your career off. I think I really admired what Aaron Spelling did just because he really kind of changed the course of television with regards to, he was involved in so many different uh, show shows that, you know, I guess now we would say had a soapy element to them, but they mm-hmm. they they weren't all soapy. I mean, I think nine oh two one oh was something that everybody in the entire world watched. You know, Melrose Place. These are things they they were kind of slice of life television shows that resonated with people because they connected with them, and there was people you could identify with, and nothing too outlandish, but it was um, allowed you to, you know what would it be like living in Beverly Hills if you're from mm-hmm. Canada, for example, mm-hmm. or uh, from France. But um, so I think, and he was very prolific as well. Um, so I, you know, for me, it's all about quality, both with regards to the content of the show and how it connects with with its audience. So I think Aaron would be somebody that I would say I looked up to um, from a television kind of perspective. Mm-hmm. and then. Um, I'm trying to think from features. I think when you're watching, when you're not, I, I never really focused on what other people were doing. I just kind of focused on my path, and my path was so different from how other people get into the film industry. I didn't get to go to film school. Um, I came from London, Ontario when I came out here. I didn't know anybody, so it was kind of more nose to the grindstone and originally, when I came out to the states, I came because I wanted to do um it's a biopic on a woman named Stella Brewer who had rehabilitated uh, chimps, actually. So I wanted to do a Born Free type show. But when I got out here, I realized you you can't make what you want to make. You have to make what other people want you to make. And I remember I pitched it at the time to one of the studios, and they told me they were making Tarzan. So um, they were already doing the same thing. And I'm like, that's not even <laughs> Tarzan. <laughs> Totally not the same <laughs> at all, but um, in their mind it was because it involved primates of some sort, men in a um, thong <laughs> in the jungle growing up with gorillas. Yeah, the well, we have our, our monkey movie for the year. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, and now that you're, you know, at somewhat established and you had a hit or some hit, you get a little bit more freedom in the industry. Are there certain things that you want to, push or are you thinking you're going to stay in the same lane or like new things you want to try no, I have, we've we've optioned it's most of our business is ip driven um with regards to um 
sorry, my dog's trying to get in. With regard, so most of our 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 uh, development slate is IP driven, um, based on trying to create shows that reach a wide audience. So obviously, you want to maximize I, uh, books that have adapting books that have already a built-in audience. You mentioned that you're a fan of horror, you're a fan of sci-fi. I'm just curious if you're going to start incorporating some of some of those okay. some of your yeah. taste into your work. Right. So I'll, let me go back and rewind a little bit. So <laughs> a lot of our slate is IP driven based on best-selling authors. So I have passion projects. I have a book by David Morrell called Testament, which is a family survival movie. And that one I think we'd either do as a feature or maybe a limited series. Um, it's definitely not romantic. It's it's pretty a uh, hard look at what it would be like and how far you would go to protect your your children. Um, and then I have uh, a book, a couple of books. Uh, one is kind of like a cross between Thorn Birds and Yellowstone called uh, Heart of Texas by Debbie Maycomber, who obviously has a huge footprint in the Hallmark universe, but we're trying to bring her into more the mainstream. Uh, and a Jackie Collins book that I'm dying to make called Hollywood Kids, which would be my version of 90210. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a more of kind of like a looking beneath the veneer of what um, successful Hollywood um, wealthy individual, the kids of wealthy individuals. And it's a group of 20 somethings who are trying to get out from the shadow of their celebrity parents and, mm -hmm. and become individuals and recognized for their own merits. Yeah. So that, that would be, you know, the only thing that they're so diverse um, from where their parents come and, you know, one's kind of modeled after Paris Hilton, one's after maybe Michael Jackson's, uh, one of his sons, uh, one after somebody who owns um, hotels or so they have nothing in common other than <clears throat> their zip code basically. Yeah. Um, so that that one, you know, it, I think that's going to be a bit of an uphill battle with Hollywood because they're like, oh, well, 90210 was made, but this is completely different. It's yeah. a Jackie Collins novel with a half a billion eyeballs attached yeah. to it. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll, we'll be able to get that and, done. You know, culture is so obsessed with the Nepo baby. You know, that's like the the term on social media sites. That would be like my pitch for your alt title. <laughs> like Nepo baby. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, that, it's funny because you know when I started pitching it, because it, it, pitching is all about when you pitch, not mm -hmm. who you pitch to. So the same person, you know, that you can pitch a television series today could say no, and it's not for us. But then maybe six months later, you go back and it's perfect for them, right? Mm -hmm. So I always tell people that no is not; it's just a two-letter word, not a four-letter word. And um, mm -hmm. no means not now. It doesn't mean not ever. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you my last question, okay. which is if I am to choose any film to show my son so he falls in love with cinema, uh, what movie should I show him? And he can be a, older at any age. Yeah, I think, you know, I think Blade Runner, uh, you know, the, either one of them, but I think the original uh, is a movie that uh, it's just it's a pretty intense film, but it's it's got a lot of message. It's stylistic, it, depending on if they want to get the bug to end up going into the film industry. It can it between acting, the directing, the cinematography. It's just uh, also at the time, you know, it was very avant garde as well. Um, so that that's one. And then my personal favorite <laughs> is yeah. the new Planet of the Apes, the first one, okay. which I thought was, but ha it wasn't just, it wasn't like the old one I saw when I was in the back of the station mm -hmm. wagon. It, it had so much gravitas and feeling and it, emotional, you know, just this emotional level with, with regards to the drama and feeling you were rooting the whole mm -hmm. show for for the gorillas, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is against your own, um, y y you know, your own human type. <laughs> yeah. So I just I thought that was, and it was the music, and it was ugh, sorry, everybody's texting the music <laughs> and the um, it, it was just a very compelling film. It was like a drama, but it just happened to have gorillas in it, and it was really about us versus them, you know. So if you're looking at something for a message, it had a message in there. Mm -hmm. um but it was kind of flavored with the with the sci-fi element of it yeah 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 i i like i love both of those i actually just read an article 
this week to rewatch both of the Blade Runners and how it is really correct and accurate with what we're seeing with AI right now and how much of it is actually coming to fruition. So they're on my list to rewatch, actually. I'm not quite with my son yet. He'll have to, we'll do it again in, in about 10 years. <laughs> exactly. Well, they'll probably have made another one by then. I know by then. It'll be like, a, it'll be like Blade Walker or like Blade Sprinter. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I love hearing your story and, and how you got to where you are. It's really inspiring. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, Jessica. Bye. If you enjoyed the conversation, please don't forget to like and subscribe. New episodes release every Wednesday. And leave a comment and let me know which movie you think I should show my son. Until next time, take care.